This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Welcome back. I'm Helen Collis, a senior health reporter with Politico. And now we have a discussion on what can be done to improve access to innovative medicines in Europe. We've just heard from Stefan at Bayer um, that from his perspective, the European pharmaceutical legislation should not be used to try to improve access. But instead, the issues lie with bureaucracy in EU countries. So we'll be able to put that claim to a couple of people on our panel next, um, one of whom represents a country that Ehrlich mentioned. And we'll be looking into what other measures, upstream and downstream, of the launch of new medicines that might help to improve access. But, be but before we start, a few housekeeping remarks. Um, you can ask questions through the swap card platform. If you're in the room, you can scan the QR code on the screens. Otherwise, you can find the details on our website uh, event page. And if you hear something you'd like to share online, our hashtag is Politico Healthcare. So joining me for this discussion, we have from my left, Cyrus Engera, MEP for Malta with the Socialists and Democrats group, and also a member of the Envy Committee. Um, Stefan Giselle, Chair of the Patient Expert Centre in Belgium, an organisation that trains people to become patient experts so they can be more effectively um, able to contribute to pos policy and regulatory discussions. Natalie Moll, Director General of the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, and Fedro Facon, Deputy CEO at the Belgian National Institute for Health and Disability Insurance, INAMI. Mm. So, Stefan, I'd like to start with you first as our patient representative on the panel. Can you set the scene for us, please, with regards to how varied access to innovative medicines is across Europe and even compared to other parts of the world? Is it really so bad? Yeah, I think uh, to give a big picture uh, <clears throat> overview to start, I think obviously uh, pharmaceuticals are important, but it's not the most important thing for patients when we look at what's happening in Europe. Um, organization of healthcare, uh, access to hospitals, access to the best care is probably more critical at the moment. Mm -hmm. So even in countries like Germany, to give one example, uh, the mortality for colorectal cancer one month after surgery varies between one to factor 14 between the best and the worst hospital. Mm -hmm. It's factor 20 in Sweden and these are countries with the money, with the capacity to pay for it. So significant changes that will not alter unless patients get an active voice in the debate to make sure that these kind of differences are eradicated. Secondly, when we look at the pharmaceutical perspective, uh, many countries, even if drugs are submitted, and uh, it takes years before they get approved and they get their status for pricing and reimbursement. And I think there's many, many years sometimes that patients have to wait for, pay for drugs to be available. But even when they're available, when they're approved at national level, doesn't mean that they are reimbursed at, uh, fully. Uh, some countries have 17% uh, government participation in the pharmaceuticals budgets or 27%. It's very limited. Or you have countries like in the Netherlands where 0.5% of uh, cancer medicines that are being prescribed were approved in the last five years. So there's sometimes for budgetary reasons a reluctance to use the treatments that are available. Mm -hmm. So th the situation is very complex and I don't think that the pharmaceutical package will actually deal with all that because the majority of the issues have to be dealt with at member state level. Mm -hmm. And how does Europe compare internationally with regards to access to innovative medicines? Can you share any details? 
But I think uh, the country where everybody launches mo first is uh, the United States. I think drugs are available immediately. I think the prices are also 30% higher, and I think, or, or even more. And I think Europe is actually the victim of the fact that we don't have a single market for pharmaceuticals. Okay. So I think that's part of the bigger <laughs> creation of, of uh, uh, the European Union. The fact that we have ne to ne uh, that there are nego negotiations at every state level is actually one of the sig most significant hurdles, uh, and we don't benefit from the size of our market for mm. uh, companies. Thank you. Um, Cyrus, um, we've heard some of the disparities in access to medicines um, between some of the EU countries. Malta has access to the least number of innovative medicines, according to FPA's most recent report. Um, just 10% of centrally authorised medicines um, in the previous four years were available in Malta. Can you explain to us what the big challenges in bringing these medicines are to market to yeah. patients in, in, Cyrus, in Malta and how much of it comes down to the size of the country? Yeah, it's not only about the size of the country, and I'll continue with what has just been said. It is the fact that we do not have a single market when it comes to medicine, when it comes to pharmaceuticals, and that creates a big problem for those countries that are either small, <laughs> are at the periphery of the European Union, or are... Uh, among, let's say, the poorest members of the European Union. And we see very different uh, levels of access to medicine in the 27 member states. And we also see the reality of different pricing when it comes to um, the buying of uh, pharmaceutical um, uh, products in the different member states. And this is something that needs to be addressed. Um, I think that one of the most positive things in the current um, proposed legislation is the fact that when it comes to data exclusivity, you need to sell uh, to the 27 different member states. However, I think that that is not enough, uh, in the sense that uh, that is one, one move forward. However, there are many other things that should be done. For instance, uh, we need to allow more parallel imports, for instance, or else uh, when we speak of the actual packages that we move away from uh, you know, the issue of languages in our packages when it comes to um, descriptions, doges, dosages, etc. I think we need to now move towards um, packaging, which could be ideal in all member states, irrespective of the language that the person speaks. Today, we have the technology to do that. Um, we know that um, we can have uh, products that can be sold in all 27 member states, yet each person, each patient, each consumer, would be able to read the details in their own language. So I think that we need to make use of the current technology. We need to make sure that um, we do not increase barriers to uh, allow access to medicines in the different member states. Uh, and apart from that, I think that if we're speaking of innovative medication, we've heard about the United States, the difference vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Europe is currently losing talent, which is going all over the globe, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the United States, in Canada, in the United Kingdom now, uh, in Japan, because, um, because of our migration policies as well. So we do not have a, 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 a clear path, legal path, um, to get talent here. And I think that I am also on the LIBE committee, so Envy and LIBE together, and that is something that we're working on, so that we need to attract talent to Europe. We cannot lose all this talent to all other major players in the, in the world. Great. Lots of very interesting points there. We're going to come back to some of the, the things you mentioned, especially around data exclusivity. Um, but I want to bring Fedro into the discussion. You're our expert on the panel who sees the daily challenge of making decisions on what Belgium's compulsory health insurance programme can and uh, will or won't reimburse. Um, the previous discussion, um, the interview with Stefan at Bayer, he mentioned that... Um, when they were trying to get their new heart failure drug to patients, um, Belgium asked for a comparator that wasn't yet on the market. That sounds like a bit of an odd demand. Is that a, is that a normal thing for, for uh, the insurance firms to be doing? It doesn't seem normal, uh, obviously, but uh, I cannot comment on, on this one dossier. I, I noted it. I will check this with, with our administration. I know there are a lot of discussions on on the evidence we ask and on the comparators we ask, that's true. Um, but there's also a reason. Uh, just until now in a discussion today, you've heard a lot of the industry's uh, aspirations and, and uh, obviously and we share that objective, uh, getting innovative medicines uh, uh, as soon as possible uh, to the client or to the patient. 
uh, but obviously I represent here the payer's perspective and um, as a payer I also need to say, for example, I think it's a very good thing that uh, there's a discussion in the pharmaceutical legislation on accelerating market entry uh, authorization, but I'm <coughs> very aware of the fact that if this accelerates even more, this also comes with um, more uncertainty, which will have an effect on the way we can negotiate uh, with regard to reimbursement at the national level. So we need to be careful about that. And um, I just want to make the remark that also, obviously, I want to have uh, uh, rapid access, but um, what we see is that more and more dossiers come with a lot of uncertainties, and we are negotiating uh, complex and confidential <laughs> agreements. And um, this is not something that is very sustainable either. So if, uh, if in the pharmaceutical legislation this is even uh, accelerated, then uh, this, will, uh, this will make it more complex at the level of health technology assessment than the real value of these uh, medicines. You've mentioned uncertainty already in, in the data that you receive. Um, what, is the, what are some of the biggest hurdles in Belgium for providing access to the 49% of medicines that, um, according to EFIA's report, that, that Belgium didn't provide access for um, of centrally authorised medicines in the last four years. And is this the time for us to start talking about the price of innovative medicines? We do not agree on these indicators, eh? so I, uh, I want to say that with regard to the weight indicators, I, I look at this very carefully, and it's interesting, but um, we made the analysis uh, on, on the numbers uh, for Belgium, and then we see, for example, that the medicines that, that are taken into account in the basket of uh, the weight indicators, 25% of these medicines is never introduced for reimbursement in Belgium. If we correct for this, then the score for Belgium is much better. And uh, what is the real challenge uh, also with uh, FPA and with industry is to come to a common understanding of, uh, of uh, access to innovation, uh, problems with regard to access to innovation. And for the moment, we don't have the same problem analysis, I think. And we have discussions on, on the indicators also with regard to the, uh, the time for approval, time for reimbursement. Yeah, you know, we have a series of uh, possibilities for clock stops. Sometimes it's at the demand of the public authorities. But if you look at this at the Belgian level, then we see that uh, uh, often it's also because of uh, uh, demands of the industry themselves. So we need to correct for this. And we need to have a, a, a real debate and, and an honest debate on the real situation. With all this, I don't want to say I'm not worried about uh, access to innovation. Uh, but um, it needs to be nuanced a little bit. And um, mm -hmm. also what I would like to add in the discussion too, and again, uh, talking as a payer, we also see that a lot of this innovative medicines, which come with a lot of aspirations and a lot of ambitions, after some time we see that the test of their added value in the real world mm -hmm. is much less than... Uh, was uh, seen in the clinical studies. We had a very good report of our Belgian Knowledge Center on that, on innovative cancer medicines that uh, in the end showed that uh, these medicines didn't really come with a lot of added value. So I don't want to overgeneralize, but as a payer, I'm worried about the fact that the debate on access to innovation, also the value of innovation, we really lack a lot of information. There's an asymmetry of information. And if we really want to overcome all this, we need a sort of new dialogue with industry. Uh, and and uh, uh, this will be the only way to move forward. Mm, Natalie, obviously, I, there are lots of things for you to come in off, there, off the back of that. First of all, the, just to explain that the weight report that FPA puts out is an annual report which analyzes um, all of the EU countries and, and beyond that, actually, into um, how quickly they're they're able to, um, the rate of adoption of, of innovative medicines. Um, just to comment on, on the measures there, which have been um, sort of criticised here by Fedro, and then some of the other remarks that he said. Well, th what you're saying is, is what, exactly what we've been, what I've been saying for a while as well, is that the conversation cannot happen just on uh, a, n a number of data being published by different parties, and then you know, we wait for the other party to answer. This, for example, would be the ideal start of the famous round table with all member states and all institutions, and we would need the hospitals and other players and industry and patients to discuss how can we improve access. 
What is the data we all agree on? And, and for me, at the moment, we don't have that dialogue. And it's really concerning because we're trying to d delegate to a piece of EU legislation that will go through a number of years through the different stages to find a solution for something which we don't even agree on the data about. So it's, it's, it's disingenuous. It's, it's not predictable. It's time consuming. And it worries me because access is already a problem today. So. I, I love, by the way, the summit today. It's very short, very fast, but it also is very constructive. And I hope it leads to those real conversations on what are the obstacles, okay, who can fix what, who's responsible for this, who's responsible for that. And, and today, you know, we've done our access commitments last April. We're measuring uh, whether the companies are submitting for pricing reimbursement in all 27 member states within two years of EMA approval. And we're showing that data so that we can take our part of responsibility. But you need that dialogue because, for example, just to agree on what the weight numbers actually are. Mm. And then when you talked about clinical, you know, HTA, God, please, can we make the HTA regulation work so that the joint clinical assessment can be agreed upon and every member state, including the smaller ones who have less know-how, can have the same level of understanding of what the scientific criteria are, evaluations. And then for the rest, there has to be a very big distinction. Mm -hmm. And Stefan, you want to come in? Yeah, I think one of the comments that we would like to make is that um, our authorities very often have a very react reactive uh, attitude towards innovation. So I think if you, ish if you have a, a real health policy that makes sure that you have patients' interests uh, at heart, you do horizon scanning to see what is coming, which diagnostic tests are available, which pharmaceuticals are in the pipeline, and see how this is going to help your population to have better health outcomes. And I think this requires a kind of a vision that you collaborate with the patients, because very often we know, and, and, and for the community that we have by type of disease, what is happening across the world, what is available, and what it actually means in reality. So work with patients on that, identify what, is, what the needs are, and then I think governments should proactively go to the companies and say, we'd like to have your technology in the country, whether it's diagnostic okay. tests or pharmaceuticals or robotic surgery or whatever the technology yeah. is. Uh, because that is actually what is going to make a big change for the patients. And then you show that you are uh, willing to invest in, in innovation. I think that will probably have a more balanced uh, discussion and I think also earlier access uh, to some of the innovation that industry comes up with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, coming back to one of the points that Cyrus mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier, which is the well-known um, incentive put forward by the Commission to um, improve access across the member states by, by um, giving them a two-year um, data exclusivity um, added um, if you launch within two years of marketing authorization. Um, I wanted to ask you, Natalie, I know the industry is not supportive of this measure, but has um, the industry done any kind of analysis of what impact this kind of measure and, in fact, the pharma proposals as a whole would have on the sector in Europe? Yes, we have, because I was really excited with President von der Leyen came with her competitiveness checks, but we were too late for the pharma legislation, right? The pharma legislation was nearly already published, so there was no real competitiveness check done, which is concerning because this is an industry that contributes <coughs> the most to the trade balance, the positive trade balance in Europe, not the negative one, and, and that provides the solutions that we need. Um, so we did do a check, and f for me, the issue, as you said, it gives you ex two extra years. No, it takes away two years, and if, if somehow you magically manage to launch in all member states, you, you may get them back. Um, and according to our study, so before I give the numbers of the impact, that's impossible, because when we studied just based on our um, commitment to launch the data every six months, 75% of delays happen after filing for pricing and reimbursement. So what we can do is we can file. And afterwards, there's a conversation. Is the data enough? Is there not enough data? Do I want it? Do I not want it? That's out of our hands. So there is no predictability in that. So f as you heard, for an investor, it's basically six years of RDP, and you'll never get the other two years back. But if we look at if we look at the projections that, that we'll publish then a bit later um, in, in early November, it looks to us that the Commission proposal, if it was taken as it is, 
it would result in the loss of about 50 of the 225 products coming um, onto the market that are based on RDP between 2020 and 2023, uh, 20, 2035, sorry. So that's a 22% loss of pro products for Europe. And as Stefan was explaining, in the past, most products were basing themselves on IP. Now that the products are more technologically advanced, the IP tends to fall and it's more based on RDP. And so you need that. And as an investor, you just need to know how long is my RDP? So when am I going to be able to have my return on investment? If you don't, if you have unpredictability, you're just going to calculate with the lowest number, six. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, you know, those, those 50 products out of 225, that's a big proportion and it's very concerning. And you, the biggest portion will be SMEs, will be the ones that will be most impacted. And I think that's... Um, concerning because the innovation comes from SMEs and it's an area where we want to continue to boost. And you were talking about um, uh, talents, keeping talents in Europe. And it's keeping talents in Europe is, yes, migration policy, but it's really the <coughs> ecosystem. If you don't have the right ecosystem in Europe, the talents won't stay. And the whole pharma le legislation proposal, the way it's created is trying to fix lots of things at the same time, whereas it should focus on incentives and safety of quality of products. That's what it should do. It should create the ecosystem to say, Europe's doing really well, come to us. Mm -hmm. And today, it's not. It's, it's a mix of everything, and it's really concerning how things are connected that are not connected in real life. Um, Fedra, I wanted to get your response to that. Um, how can we improve predictability for industry so that they, it's easier to really plan where products are going to be um, in the coming years? One of the um, topics uh, we want to put on the agenda during the Belgian presidency of the EU Council will be on uh, the definition of unmet medical needs, uh, unmet social uh, needs also. And um, I agree with Stefan if he says that um, as authorities we need to be clear on, on what are the topics or the domains in, in public health and, and in healthcare where we want to invest in and where we see that there are real needs. So I think that um, uh, there, there already exists a series of mechanisms and also horizon scanning and early dialogue, etc. cetera. Um, and it's important to go beyond only medicines, but I do agree that uh, this is a positive um, point of the pharmaceutical legislation to try to reinforce this. Even if we have remarks, we think that um, uh, the fact that it will be uh, coordinated by EMA, we have some concerns that it will be too supply driven and we certainly need to take into account uh, the ideas of HTA, of payers, of patient organizations on what these unmet needs really are. So uh, this is, uh, this is one, uh, one important uh, fact I would uh, like to mention here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to change tack slightly and talk about another um, uh, measure that some countries are using to try to improve access. And Cyrus, um, one of the often mentioned solutions is joint procurement of medicines, especially for highly priced medicines. Malta in 2017 joined Cyprus, Greece, Italy, Spain and Portugal in signing the Valletta Declaration, which was an alliance to explore strategies to jointly negotiate these kinds of um, medicines uh, prices. And in 2019 agreed to share the confidential drug prices with each other. Um, what has this led to for Malta? Has there been any progress made with joint pro procurements? Um, and if not, why not? Well, the the progress that was made was for all the European Union during the COVID pandemic, where for the first time um, as a union, we bought vaccines together in order to make sure that every single country, wherever you live in the European Union, you can have access to vaccines and at an affordable price for all member states, which would have been the same. I think that one of the most important things when it comes to um, medicine and pharmaceuticals is price transparency and also cost transparency, because um, I understand that um, from the industry side, there are certain elements that also need to be taken into account. However, when, when I hear things like um, Europe would lose out. I'm sorry, it is not Europe that would lose out because there are a number of Europeans living in small member states or else in peripheral member states that already do not have access to a number of, of medicines. And I think that it is it does not make sense in a European Union that prides itself of a single market, a European Union that prides itself of moving forward together 
to leave those uh, at the periphery simply falling behind. And therefore, we need to have legislation which is strong enough to make sure that wherever you live in the union, you can get access to the medicine that you actually need. Um, and we cannot create uh, a, a system in which it would not it, it will not give you value to live in certain member states of the European Union. And I think that that is something that we really need to work on and to reduce disparities as much as possible. But the answer to your question is transparency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And obviously we have uh, Beneluxa in its uh, Belgium and Beneluxa, the other um, northern alliance of, of drug pricing um, negotiations. Um, in the eight years since it was first um, formed, um, it has secured joint pricing agreements, I believe, for two medicines, um, an orphan drug in 2018 and a gene therapy in 2021. Um, but more recently, the initiative agreed to end pricing talks with another gene therapy um, because the manufacturer was not prepared to make the product available under the proposed reimbursement conditions, Beneluxa said. Um, Fedro, joint procurement is often hailed as a saviour for the access issues. Is it really worth the added workload and, and benefit? We are absolutely still uh, in favour and still supporting the Beneluxa initiative we launched uh, a few years ago because even if I agree that for some products it would be interesting to have a joint procurement at the EU-wide level, I think that could be uh, interesting and I'm also thinking about, for example, uh, antibiotics, etc., how we could arrange a, a financing system all over the European Union, for example. But I do believe that uh, more on the short term, uh, probably it will be regional collaborations uh, like uh, Beneluxa, there are some others also in uh, the Nordics, etc., um, who are trying to do this. And just until now, when you look at a number of dossiers and, and their result, you could ask yourself, is it really worth it? But um, Beneluxa does a lot more than only joint uh, negotiations on reimbursement. We exchange a lot of information on policies, uh, on data. We also do joint uh, HTA. And so we have a lot of activities there and, and creating a network, also trying to influence the European agenda. I do believe that uh, the joint uh, price and reimbursement negotiations should be reinforced. Uh, this also means that just until now in Beneluxa, um, in fact, it's a voluntary procedure. Eh? So firms can choose, uh, even if the countries in Beneluxa say we want to do this together, if the firm doesn't want to enter in that procedure, then uh, then in fact uh, they can uh, they can indeed uh, choose not to. Uh, so I think that we need to. Um, reinforce the possibilities to drive firms into uh, into joint negotiation um, because it's better for us, for the authorities, but also I hope obviously that uh, for the industry there will also be added value because procedures are more quick or more transparent, uh, that there's more guarantee of a, a qualitative um, a dossier and um, this is something we need to move forward on and I hope in the next few years that uh, within Beneluxa and maybe at the European level too, uh, that we can have more dossiers of joint negotiation. Mm. And Stefan? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I think it's a very complex matter. And I know that uh, there are differentiated prices across Europe sometimes for the same treatment. So the list price is one thing, and then there are rebates negotiated at national level, which makes some of the drugs a lot cheaper in countries like Romania, Bulgaria. Uh, where suddenly they have, they have access at a completely different price. And I think that's, of course, what also generates uh, parallel uh, imports. I think it's very important to make sure that if there's a, a common procurement, that that will not increase the price everywhere and, and no longer make these drugs available in more resource-limited settings. And I think that is one of the challenges that has to really be taken into account. So regional procurement or sub-regional procurement uh, to a certain extent, yes, because it has to be comparable. Nobody knows what the rebates are, so asking for transparency is not going to solve the issue. It's going to, to, to make the prices higher. Um, there's no direct information from that, but you can see in countries where generics and biosimilars have launched, that in the biggest markets, the highest profit gains are generated. So the budget at, at Belgium, uh, Germany, or, or the Netherlands decreases substantially 
once a generic or biosimilar enters the market. That is less the case in countries like Romania and Bulgaria, where the impact is limited. So giving already the impression that the original budget for that uh, drug was probably low. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but we see that access improves everywhere. And just to be sure, sometimes the market and the number of patients getting access once generics enter the market is around 50% uh, overall. Okay. Yeah. And I want to bring Natalie in on the topic of joint procurement. We've had yep. quite a lot of support for it here. Um, also support for cost and price transparency, um, the need to drive companies to participate in these schemes. Um, but I know that um, there are concerns about the prices that um, some of the smaller countries might face if, if we went down that route. Yeah. Tell me yeah. what, what the industry thinks about this approach. So really, thank you, because really important points. And um, on... No, not leaving any countries behind, and I should have mentioned, in addition to the commitment to file and measure that filing, we also had and have a, re a proposal to go for equity-based tiered pricing. So to be able to sell our products at a price and depending on the capacity of the country to buy and also willingness. Does it matter? Does it not matter? And this is what we do in the whole world except for Europe. Because in Europe, we have a situation where products move around. So some, indeed, the idea is there. But today, unless we have that roundtable discussion where we all sit down and we agree what the problems are that cause shortages, non-availability, uh, um, in general, access hurdles, and we agree to ways to fix them together with everybody chipping in, we're not going to find... So we can come up with proposals as an industry forever, but it's not going to work if you know, products disappear suddenly. So I think it's, it's, really important. it's a really important point. So there's more than one element. There are, we've at least got five proposals, but we've seen 10 hurdles. So um, the five proposals are not going to be enough. On, on cross-country collaboration, um, FPA also supports cross-country collaboration when the access can be made faster. We've always said that. If the access is, is improved, if actual speed is gained and the product can reach patients faster, we have no problem with... Um, cross-country collaboration is different on joint procurement because according to the studies we've done and the, we, we certainly would see the price coming down for the countries that are more able to buy and the price going up and still being too high for the countries who can't. So you wouldn't solve the problem. You'd probably exacerbate it. I know I'll come in one moment, Cyrus, but I just want to push you on that because yeah. I know the industry really supports the tiered pricing model. Yeah. Is there a way to create a tiered pricing model for joint procurement? I think the, the idea is then you're mixing two things together. I think every country wants what it needs and knows what it needs. And in that sense, in the rest of the world, that's why we do tiered pricing. So I think it's important to leave that responsibility in the member state to say, OK, I have this possibility to pay to this event. I have these amount of patients. I, my healthcare system can or can't incorporate the product, this is what I'm unwilling to pay. And the, co the company can then adapt to that. But today, we don't have a situation. We have um, uh, price referencing between countries. So if you start doing that, it's not going to be possible today. So we need to have, and I'm really, I know I'm boring about this, but we need to have that roundtable discussion where all the product problems are put on the table. We agree which ones are the real ones and which, the measure, which are the right measurements. And then everybody takes responsibility for fixing something. Mm -hmm. And until we do that... And Cyrus, you want to... Yeah, yeah on cross-border, I think we also need to look at um, cross-border wholesale dealers and have legislation that actually allows the creation of such uh, wholesale dealer, dealers across... Uh, member states. And I return to the original thing that I, I was saying, because ultimately, um, we're still speaking of uh, big markets, small markets, um, less affluent markets, more affluent markets. I think we need to realize, finally, that we have one internal market. And we need to make sure that um, pharmaceutical products are not exclusive to a few of these markets over here. Um, in, in another political event, I had mentioned that we're not speaking of, I don't know, some Gucci handbags that are exclusive to a, a certain part of, of the population. We're speaking of medicine, which is essential for all. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to raise one other um, suggestion which was put towards um, a committee last week. Um, a group of health economists in Milan um, presented the case not only for joint procurement, but also for a European health research body, which would drive innovation where it is most needed. And I just wanted to get your reactions to this kind of model. Stefan, what's your response to that? I think that would be great 
if you bring excellence together, and I think that's what's happening in the United States, we're fragmenting, we're dissipating mm -hmm. our research uh, efforts um, to every region, to small and, and big companies, public and private. So we have fantastic mechanisms to, uh, to, to fragment and uh, all the investment that we make. Europe, European Union spends around 8 billion euro in public health research, 8 billion. The United States, last year, 38 billion, and Biden has asked to increase it to 45 billion euro next year. Uh, industry spent 212 billion euro last year in, in research. Europe is going down. We had a little peak with the COVID crisis, it's going down again. The, the big challenge in Europe is that we do not have universities like, or, or ecosystems like in the United States, where you have multi-billion dollar academic settings where all this money can be spent on research with all the best uh, people around it working together uh, looking at technology to make it work uh, we, we push things down into the countries i think it would be much much better to put all the best knowledge together in a few spaces in Europe, give it a lot of money, and I think look at the needs from a public health perspective where investment should be made. And again, sorry to repeat it, prioritize your research investments together with patients because we know where the needs are. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we see that totally useless innovation is brought to the market. And it, it doesn't match the expectations of the, the environment and the context of patients because it has been ill-designed. You know, it has been poorly designed by people who are fantastic in research or in medical science, but who do not understand the life of patients. So this would be my message. Yeah. Thank you. And um, Natalie, just your reaction to a, a European health research body. Is that, is that the way things should be going? Well, Stefan told, said the numbers. So in Europe, it's 42 billion euros in research every year that this industry is spending. If you look at the proposal, <coughs> it will go down. Our share of R&D will continue to go down because we've already lost 25%. So um, I don't think we can make that up, make it up with European Research Centre. I think you have to have the right environment in Europe so that everybody wants to invest there. We have 11 times less capital in Europe than in the US. It has always been like that. So we have less money. Yeah. Let's just be smart and make sure that we have the right environment so that investors feel this is the place to go. Today, it's not the case. Maybe with the revision, it can be. We really hope so. so. That's all we've got time for on this discussion. Thank you so much to our panelists for joining us today. We've had um, a really fascinating debate. Um, Um, just to wrap up, I think we've heard that there's a real um, drive to find a solution to this. We need to get everyone around the table. Joint procurement is definitely something that I think we're not going to see the end of. And, um, but there are concerns around the current proposals, around pushing the um, faster access and whether that's going to create more uncertainty for decision makers in bringing these drugs to market. Um, OK, that's all we've got time for. Um, our next on our agenda, we have a brief sponsored seg segment from Emergent. And then after that, we have a panel discussion on keeping health at the centre of pandemic preparedness. So please stay seated. Um, and Mr. Storfsi, if you can come to the stage, please. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs>